Hi, everyone. We're just giving a second for everyone to join us here. Welcome. Okay. I, I think ready, ready to go. go. Can I start, can I start by asking everyone, everyone to mute their, their um, system, 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 please? system, please? Okay. 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 okay, perfect. Can everyone hear me? Is that good? Yes. Perfect. So just wanted to take a moment to say um, thank you to everyone for joining us on a Friday night. There are lots of really exciting things you could be doing, uh, but you're here to support this effort by Tour for Diversity, SNMA, and LMSA, uh, which is really an incredible partnership. I have to shout out um, the leadership of Tour for Diversity, who's been working to increase the diversity in medical schools for 10 years at this point. They have graduated undergrads into medical school who are now uh, in residency and some of them uh, attending. So really incredible work. Uh, they pull this together every year um, for multiple specialties. In addition to having the panels where we talk about the application process for residency, they also match uh, some of the applicants with mentors to provide mock interviews. So it's really incredible work. We're really grateful for everything that they do. And uh, Cam Matthews, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we'll get started here just by um, having everyone introduce themselves. I'm gonna start by just asking the panelists to introduce themselves. I'll be honest, in the past when we've done this, we've also asked all of the um, audience to introduce themselves as well. But today we have 37, which is a lot. So very cool. Uh, we may not be able to have time to have everyone unmute and introduce, but um, you know, while the panelists are introducing themselves, I will ask uh, the rest of the audience to please just jump in the chat. Just tell us your name, tell us where you're from, if there are any other um, interesting tidbits we should know, like if you're MBPHD or if you're an FMG, um, anything else like that that may help inform the decision, please put that in the chat as well, because that way we can really tailor our conversations uh, to, to some of the questions that you may have. Um, but I'll start by letting all the panelists introduce themselves. I'll start uh, with Anand, do you wanna go first? Hey, how's it going on? Thank you so much for having me for this panel. It's so uh, wonderful being with so many uh, amazing panelists and so many great students. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Anand. I'm a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin, and I'm a breast imager. So um, and my background is in public health, and I do a lot of research in the health equity. So uh, for those people who've got interests, uh, my background is in public health, and I'm really passionate about that. And I love the opportunity to uh, embark upon initiatives to improve access to imaging. So if people are interested in, in public health and research related to that and uh, breast imaging, I'm uh, very excited about those particular topics. I'm happy to answer those particular questions in this session. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Pine, will you go next, please? Sure. Uh, Pine Massivan, uh, Program Director of Radiology uh, at Stanford, and uh, just thrilled to be here. Uh, first gen, and so I feel very passionate uh, about um, the effort, and um, I'm uh, available here, but then also elsewhere to help um, however you find uh, necessary uh, or helpful, and thank you. Thank you, and he it's true, he is very accessible to people, so thank you for all of your years of, of uh, helping in the effort. Uh, now we'll go over to Dr. Bradshaw. Hi, everybody. My name is Marcus Bradshaw. I'm a nuclear radiologist, and I do think that's the best feel. I'm just going to throw that out there to these breast imagers on the call. Um, I'm the vice chair of diversity affairs for the Department of Radiology, and I'm just thrilled to see and interact with all of you today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Mamadou, do you want to go, please? Hi, I'm Mamadou Snuggle, one of the IR attending at the University of uh, Michigan, and I'm also a program director for independent residency. Uh, I just saw the sign for Wisconsin, go Wisconsin. That's where I did my medical school, you know, budget forever, you know. <laughs> awesome. And your program director. 
Yes. Awesome. Um, can we have Laura Heinemann, please? Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Laura Heinemann. Um, I was at Duke for many, many years as Assistant Program Director. Um, I am starting at Vanderbilt next week. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of in between gigs right now, but I'm delighted to be here. Thank, Thank you, Laura, for all your passion. Thank you so much for coming this year and every year. <laughs> and uh, we'll go over the Dorothy. Hello, my name is Dr. Dorothy Tamayo Mudio. I am an abdominal imager at UCSD. I lead the um, equity and diversity efforts at UCSD. Also, I'm one of the co-directors for a pipeline program to get undergraduates interested in MD or PhD. I definitely have an interest in helping low-income students make it to, you know, medicine. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being passionate. Thank you for all the work you do for diversity, even outside of this chat. It's awesome to have you. Um, I am Tomo Mofue. I'm a breast radiologist. Breast is best. Um, I was at medical school at Duke, um, residency at Duke as well with Laura um, before uh, moving to MD Anderson where I did fellowship in breast and, and um, work as a breast imager and serve as uh, strategic, strategic director of education. Um, some of my work includes global health work, um, patient advocacy. So um, whatever questions do you have, I think this is a panel that shows many other interests and ways that you can leverage your radiology training. So uh, a lot of that is really going to come out in the discussion today. I'll start out um, by just letting everyone know you can always post a question in the chat at any time. We want to tailor this to you. Um, don't be shy. If you are shy and you want to post it anonymously, you can private message me with the question and I'll read it out loud and keep you anonymous. But um, really, it's for you. So this is really the opportunity to be yourself and, and get what you need out of the session. Um, so while we're getting some of those questions come in, I will jump right in. Um, let me ask, so for the panelists, uh, why would you say that you consider radiology to be a good field? What do you think um, are some of the things that should attract people to radiology? You know, I'll, uh, maybe I'll just uh, jump in. You know, I think uh, it, for me, uh, you know, being at the forefront of the technology in uh, medicine, I think is exciting. And I think increasingly there's, there's almost no patient care that occurs without the involvement of imaging in some fashion. So you get to touch patients uh, uh, across the board. And sometimes you're just very pivotal, pivotal in making that diagnosis. So it's an incredible team effort between you and your partners in care uh, in really taking care of patients. And I, I, I really love that aspect of radiology. Yeah, go ahead, Alan. Oh, well, uh, just uh, as I said, I'm gonna shamelessly plug breast imaging uh, during the course of this session. But um, I, I think it's a really humbling uh, a position to be in. And I'm, I'm really fortunate to be in this position because we encounter women at a point in which they're coming in, they're just going for a routine screening exam, and oftentimes people find things. And you're at the very uh, beginning in many cases of people's cancer journey. So I take that as a, a, as a humbling responsibility to be with patients and their families at that very moment of their lives. And, and as you can see in radiology, there's a, there's a range of different things, you know, for example, uh, of, of you know, procedures and involvement in patient care. But in, in this particular aspect of patient care, I think it's a very special one to be part of, and I'm humbled and honored to be part of that. And for me, this also lends itself to my public health outreach too, because one of the things that is, is so important to, to many of us here uh, in, this, in this room is to make sure that we can improve access for patients so that uh, instead of seeing, in, we want patients to come to our doorsteps with cancers and things that are curable. And we, we don't like to see it. And the ones that get to me are the ones where people show up with really advanced cancers, large cancers spread their lymph nodes and stuff. And, and that's the stuff that inspires me to go out there Go out in the community and really make a difference in terms of uh, preventing that to make it uh, make that uh, make that doesn't make sure that doesn't happen anymore. Awesome. 
I'm, I'm going to plug, I forgot to say, I'm a cardiothoracic radiologist, so I think chest is best. Um, and, um, and there are a couple of reasons that I think radiology is a phenomenal field. Um, a few people have touched on some of them from my perspective, but um, first of all, I mean, everybody gets a chest film, right? So, I mean, it seems. Um, and therefore, we really do have um, the potential of impacting lives from pretty much every field of medicine. Um, and you can have a really substantial impact. Um, I actually recently had a case portable chest film, somebody just getting a line placement for a GI issue. And on a portable chest radiograph, I saw that there was a nodular opacity, saw that there was there were outside images from years ago, and it turned that this nodule had grown, and it turns out that they had a pulmonary AVM and had had a history of a stroke, which is one of the possible um, complications from a pulmonary AVM. And just on a portable film, you can put it all together. So it's it's um, a fascinating sort of intellectual exercise, but it's also you have a huge impact from all different directions. And, and I think that's a, it's a really um, remarkable combination where you're constantly learning new things. I am not a tech person. I'm, I'm, I'm technically challenged, I would say. And yet, <laughs> and yet you know, I'm still, on, I, I have learned cardiac imaging, and, um, which is, you know, on the forefront of a lot of medicine. So it's, it's a really, um, it's something for everyone. Um, awesome. And it's exciting. It never gets boring. Awesome. awesome. We, we have, have some questions, questions coming, coming in, in now. now. Uh, this first question says, how many programs would you suggest applying to, advanced and preliminary, uh, during the current application cycle? Any uh, one of the panelists can unmute and, and jump in. So I asked one of my mentees who's on R1 now that very question, you know, how many programs did she apply to? Uh, she told me she applied to 10 prelim medicine and 10, 10 prelim transitional year programs and felt like that was enough to get a significant number of interviews for her to uh, successfully match for her pre prelim year. And what about for radiology? How many programs are you seeing people apply to? Oh God, it's, so I, I think you have to take, everyone's situation is a little bit different, right? We don't know what scores, what research, what, what you have on your application. Um, I think what I've seen recently is that people are applying to like 40 to 50 programs is I think the average number that I saw a statistic on not too many weeks ago. And so that's unfortunate in, in my opinion, because I think it's just led to this application creep where everyone doesn't want to be the person who's not applying to 40, 50 programs. So then the number just keeps going up uh, every year. Um, but the, the data shows that actually medical students are less likely to get their top choice now with so many people applying so broadly. Uh, I'll just tell you as a program, it makes it very difficult for us to know who really wants to come to our program when we get 1300 applications. It's just like, uh, we, we know that's not true. And so it's kind of, it makes it hard for us to sift, sift through it, but I'd say 40 to 50 programs, depending on what your application looks like. So yeah, that actually leads very nicely into our next question, which is how do you think regional preference on the supplemental application will impact the application review process? I, I've, I think it very much uh, depends. Oh, Dorothy, go ahead, Dorothy. Oh, I was just gonna make a quick comment that um, it definitely impacted me, which I didn't know it would have. Um, I was from California, um, but at that time I wanted to stay in Boston and people were like, oh, she's from California. She wants to go to back to California. There's no chance she's going to come here. And I was actually declined an interview. It wasn't until I messaged the program director 
and said, I'm interested in your program. Um, can basically, can I get an interview? And um, that allowed me a door into the Boston interviews. Mm -hmm. And then from that, I also got another Boston interview where they literally told me in the interview, we weren't going to interview you based on the school you came from and where you were, where we thought you wanted to go. And I was shocked by that. The only reason they ended up interviewing me at the, prog at the program I ended up matching into um, was because I guess somebody had dropped the spot or they had more openings. So it really, you'd never know what a program is going to judge your application on or what they may perceive in your application. Um, so make it known. Yeah, I would agree. And Payam, I think you were gonna speak to that question as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I, I have pretty strong feelings about this in that it shouldn't matter because I feel like, um, we, you know, we want to recruit the best folks. And, um, but, but as, as Marcus was alluding to, it's really hard to get through like a thousand applications in a meaningful way. And what's happening now is with the Zoom interviews, nobody ever declines an interview. So folks who have no intention whatsoever of coming to your residency will still interview and take up a spot of somebody who might otherwise have wanted to, to go. So I think it's really complicated things, even for the programs who don't want to allow that sort of the regionalization to, to, to be the primary thing. So I would second what we were saying earlier especially with the preference signaling in your own program and the programs uh, where you've rotated is really just be explicit with them. You know, do a, I've thought I've made it clear that I wanna come here by visiting. Uh, do I need to, uh, you know, would, do, would, would you like for me to, or do you expect for me to use one of my signals at your program just so that it could be explicit and that you, you smartly use the, the few uh, signals you have. And they made this decision that despite that, if you're applying to IR and DR, you still only get the, I think it's the six signals. So really it's a limited number. And I think that you have to be wise about how you use them. I do think programs do use your intention to match in their city as a strong factor, uh, um, despite my advice to them not to. Yeah, yeah agree I agree with that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll... Sorry, there's this echo. Uh, there's a question here I think we should address. What do you look for in an applicant? Maybe I can, I can jump in here. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot. I, I'm going to second the, you know, making, making sure that uh, you bring people attention to you know your application. I think the regional the the Zoom thing really made things a little more complicated for us also. But you know there is definitely a strong regional bias when it comes to University of Michigan, and I think I can speak to most of the Midwest places going to be like that. When I was in Madison, Wisconsin, similar issue. I got to do with really trying to, you know, uh, figure out who legitimately uh, interested in the program. And no, you know, we, <laughs> no offense, but when you have you from California, usually that's a little minus for you when it comes to our program because we really know Californians. They're always gonna they want to stay there. Uh, but that being said, you know, I was a New York guy until I went to Madison, Wisconsin. I would I didn't want to go anywhere. So there is definitely you know, um, it, it jump from one area to another. And the only way you can sometimes figure that out is by the person expressing the interest. Uh, as far as, you know, who makes a ideal candidate, I think from our, you know, I can just speak to, to University of Michigan and IR, you know, IRDR program. I think things that are, we are looking for are usually things that are overlooked. Uh, and I'm in a panel and I'm usually, uh, a big proponent of the underdog 
uh, things that people that people do not see that don't become visible based on just browsing through the score and stuff. We usually look for people that are, you know, humble, down to earth, things that, you know, we want it to be leader, but we don't want you to, in your application to come through as God created you, then that was the end, right? So we want you to be a strong candidate, but at the same time, uh, be grounded. Uh, so things that we look for, yes, you know, because we do this with IRDR, there is an artificial board cutoff that we establish just to, you know, to cut down the number a little bit. But once you get on an interview, uh, everybody is treated the same. We're just looking for a good team player, uh, academically strong, uh, personable, and legitimately interested uh, in, uh, in the field. And, you know, things that you really, really, emphasize, you know, put a lot of, uh, 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 emphasis on is really going to be the letter of recommendations. You know, one one day is not enough. Uh, we really, you know, strongly rely on our colleagues, whatever institution you're from, you know, the word that we all know this, you can read between the line, you can say a lot with that saying, with that saying it, uh, and letter of recommendations really carries a lot of weight uh, when it comes to most of those stuff, because, you know, those people are watching you uh, on a daily basis and they can, you know, and we trust each other. And if there's anybody who's interested, you know, we are interested, the program is interesting, we usually pick up a phone uh, and IR world especially that is very small. So you would know somebody in each and every program. So it's very hard to hide between the, you know, behind the numbers, we'll find out, but just be yourself, be humble. Those are the kind of normal people that we look for. I, I, I love, love you. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh, yeah, I, I love your comment about, about the little bit um, um, uh, uh, I love the. Okay. Um, so I, I love your comment about um, looking for other can candidates and characteristics and things that, because I mean, there's a lot of people, there are a lot of uh, things and applications that people look for and they're sort of obvious stuff about, you know, the research and other stuff and typical, but there's other characteristics that I think show a lot of grit and resilience and a lot of work ethic and stuff that often gets neglected. And I think that some of those things, I mean, if somebody, for example, works uh, as like a, a manager for like a fast food restaurant or somebody, you know, waits tables for long periods of time or, you know, serve as a manager for, you know, some some sort of a blue collar occupation or something, there's a lot that that comes out of those occupations and those professions. And you find out, oh, uh, wait, wait, you're, so you're a full-time college student and you're working 40 hours a week in an occupation. And somehow you did, you exceeded, you excelled academically and you were able to go to medical school. And sometimes those things don't come through on applications. And so, you know, that's certainly one thing that I enjoy looking for that because I think you find some real terrific individuals. You know, there's some of these people who've got like a chip on their shoulder and they're, you know, they're gonna put in the work and they're gonna really, um, they're gonna be really excellent doctors when, when everything is all finished and done. And I, I love seeing people like that. Um, and I think uh, to your point about um, Midwest as well too, like, you know, it's interesting because a lot of, you know, when it all sort of um, boils down to it, a lot of it, people end up ending uh, back to uh, places where they have some connection to. And I'm, I'm an East Coaster my, my whole life, but my wife's family is all from the Midwest. So, you know, <laughs> people end up like migrating back to wherever they <laughs> have some sort of like local familial connections. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, well, I was gonna say just a couple of things. Um, you know, I can only, I can really speak just to Duke, um, where I would say we didn't actually have much of a regional preference, but I do think that um, expressing an interest in the program carries a huge amount of weight. So I, I think that the signaling potentially may be very important um, with, you know, thousands of applicants coming. Um, I think a lot of pl some places um, consider the four years, five years, if you um, add on a fellowship um, of residency to be, you know, a place you might want to explore a different part of the country. And so from that aspect, I think the, you know, where you're from is less of an issue, but it, I do think that um, expressing a real interest, particularly um, as somebody said, if you've done a rotation there or if you know if you know somebody there, I think it's really helpful to to touch base. 
Um, I will also add in terms of the application, um, I think the personal statement's really important. That's where a lot of the information that's sort of behind the scenes can come out and, and people can shine. Um, keep it to one page. I, I think it's pretty unusual to have a personal statement that goes more than a page where it seems like the person has been, you know, is very sort of thoughtful about the message that they want to convey. Um, I think a personal statement that that um, conveys, again, thoughtfulness um, and, and a unique aspect about yourself um, is really helpful. Think about the message that you want to send and how you can um, convey that concisely. So from my standpoint, letters of recommendation, as was mentioned, and the personal statement, I think, are more important than a lot of the you know, um, grades and scores and well, and a lot of things are going to be pass fail now step. So, yeah, yeah. so we so have we a have lot of questions coming in. Um, so we're going to try to get through some of these. I think we can get through kind of quickly. Uh, so I'll do a rush of those and then we'll go back to some other longer questions. Um, are there any chances of getting an interview if you're applying late in the season or an IMG. I think there's several concerns around being an IMG in applications and your chances in radiology. So I'm going to be honest, I think it's tough for IMGs. Um, frequently, you see them having to do, you know, research for a year or two, um, trying to make connections in the field. I mean, one of my mentees is a, she's an IMG going into neurology. And I think a lot of people just don't understand the struggle because they haven't been there. They haven't had those connections and they haven't seen, you know, the, the person who's working two jobs trying to save up $5,000 to come do, you know, a shadow rotation to try to get a letter of recommendation. Um, so it, it, it is tough. I think there, there are some, um, particularly I've seen some for radiology in this past cycle where people have gone through and they've listed programs that were IMG friendly. So certainly, you know, do your homework and make sure that you're taking the time to apply to the programs that are actually going to look at your application. I think that's a, a big portion of it. Along those lines, um, there's this question about for IMGs, should they preference signal um, to the big Ivy League schools that maybe have accepted fewer IMGs in the past, uh, but you know those are the schools I guess that they're passionate about versus just trying to stick to the schools that have a documented history of, of admitting IMB, IMGs. I think Mark has probably alluded to this before, which is it very much depends on what your, app, what your application looks like. And there are some IMGs who've done essentially a PhD's worth of research with incredible uh, um, a publication track record, uh, that would be a different category, say that if you've done, um, say less research, because that's not the ultimate goal for you, um, but that you've gotten phenomenal clinical references, for example. So I think, you know, I, I would tailor the approach. And I think, uh, um, it, it's hard to say how the preference signaling would interact uh, with the, the fact that you're IMG, because we don't have a good sense of how the preference signaling is going to do at all, because it's the first year. So it's, it's, it's a little bit harder for me to sort of put those things together. I, I would just answer the other question about having a late application. I think um, as an IMG, it is an uphill climb. And I think, so you wanna make sure you address all of those other issues. So not having a late application would be very preferable. You don't wanna give anyone an excuse to not look at your application very carefully. And I think being late is one of those things that really um, uh, for good or ill, I think most people look poorly on, on that. And you may have a, a great reason for that, um, but, but I would just work very hard to avoid that, I, I would say. 
And I'll just add, it's also not even that you look poor, poorly necessarily, but with a thousand applications or something, a lot of times the committee, you know, wants to look at everything by such and such a date, and then they're not going to sort of keep screening whether somebody's going to turn something in late. Absolutely right. Could not agree with that more. Um, the committees have a lot of them have already set their timeline for how the interview season is going to go, the application season is going to go. And so once the ball gets rolling, it's difficult to go back to uh, the start. Um, so more questions here. How do we, how do you plan on screening applicants now that you have some applicants coming in with pass fail scores um, and some coming in with three digit scores? And will step two hold more weight for those with a pass fail step one? So I'm hopeful that we will continue to look at everybody's application, which is what we've done in the past. And so it wouldn't matter if you've had a scale step one score or not. Um, I do think if we're being honest that step two is gonna hold more weight. And so those programs that were previously screening based off of step scores are probably gonna screen based off of step two scores. It's just, to me, it just makes sense. If, if that's what they cared about before, then they're gonna move on to the next metric that they have. Dorothy, you're smiling because you want to say something? I was smiling because the comments about the programs that have that record, it's not going to change the record. And, and I do agree that you, the, the programs that have a holistic approach, it's not going to have as much weight. Um, but you, you need to figure out which programs are which, and that's tough. Thank you. Mamadou, were you going to say something? No, no, no. I was going to say exactly the same, the same thing. We're going to have to, you know, in order to triage, you're going to have to come up with some, some sort of metrics. And yes, it's step two become the next best thing. That's what people are going to, you know, lean toward. And, and so should people apply to a program if their uh, step score is below the cutoff that's advertised by the program? I would say absolutely you should. Don't, don't, you know, you shouldn't make yourself a rate limiting factor. You know, you never know who's going to come across your application. I, I may be one of those guys. Uh, definitely, you know, as was mentioned already, personal statement, letter recommendations, those are the things that really, swell, you know, that I, I put a lot of weight on. Uh, the other thing besides this, so the step score, that, like I said, is artificial, but the, aggressiveness, when I said aggressiveness, but this, this, the, the candidate expressing their interest in the program really can sway a lot of things. So there are a lot of applications. I can tell you for the past few years, you know, it's not uncommon that somebody who has a low, you know, uh, board scores reach out and get an interview and end up making on a top 10 list. It's just like it's not uncommon because they have a lot to offer, but you would never have come across their, you know, the application if they hadn't advocated for themselves. So don't limit yourself uh, and let us let us do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love how positive everyone is because it, it is it, it is a life changing experience, but it should be a positive experience. Um, can we talk about DO applicants uh, for a second? Does being a DO student affect the application? Uh, anything they can do to stand out, be competitive? Well, I, I will say this that I think there are probably programs, you know, similar to people. Anyway, there are programs that have had a history of taking DO candidates, and there are programs who haven't. Um, and with, you know, again, a thousand applicants or something, um, realistically, if a program has not taken DO applicants in the past, it's possible they won't look at DO applicants. It's, it's one sort of way of teasing out the, all the different applications. Um, that being said, I will say that if there are programs that haven't taken DO resident, um, candidates previously, but have had a history of taking DO fellows, then I think that that can actually sway things. Um, so, you know, never say never.
Yeah, we encounter the dual uh, applicant, you know, uh, you know, often enough. I think one of the things that we look for, we we take deals in both fellowship and IRDR residency. But the thing that we use or I use uh, as part of a triage system is to really see if the interest is there. So if you do, I would strongly recommend not only taking the complex, you know, the DO exam, but taking a USMLE. If you don't have both, if I have two DO candidates, one did both, the other one did, you know, I'm most likely going to lean toward whoever did the USMLE. They made the extra effort. And I think if you want to be considered like, you know, the others, I think that usually shows a strong interest. And that's, you know, I would admit that has been one of the ways that we triage. So taking a USMLE, taking time to take that, it can go a long way. I'm also just going to throw out, sorry, um, look to see who's got DO on um, people, people who have DO degrees on faculty, because that's potentially going to make a really big difference too. So, Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, the data is very clear that uh, DO physicians are, uh, as you know, equivalent to uh, MD physicians, and then the data is equally clear that the climb is slightly more uphill for residency. So it, it's an unfortunate challenge, um, but 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 I think increasingly you're seeing that people recognize that it's an it's sort of an unfair assessment, and that uh, the representation of DO. Uh, uh, throughout uh, is is improving, uh, so so um, uh, you know um, uh, I'm very hopeful, and and I think that you should be as well. Wonderful. Uh, we have a few questions about the meaningful experiences survey. I'm sorry, meaningful experiences essay. Um, People are asking, uh, can we talk about clinical clerkship experiences in that essay? Um, do you have any general advice about that essay? Do you, is it okay to talk about experiences that occurred before medical school in that essay? Uh, any feedback from Palin Nelson Great. I think people are, people want to encounter someone who's genuine. So if you talk about something you're passionate about, if that was a clerkship, if it was pre-medical school, uh, I think that I, I wouldn't limit yourself from that perspective. Uh, the passion will come across. You want to be your best self. And that means being who you are and being true to yourself. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, that comes across and is appreciated. I think everybody, everybody loves a good story. And I think the way that you can tie that meaningful experience to other parts of your application that sort of paint this picture of who you are and that allows us to put those dots together. I think everybody loves to see that and recognizes that that is more meaningful than a board score. Um, and second, what Anan said earlier, uh, you know, what customer service jobs, uh, you know, if I've seen somebody who's been a waiter or a waitress for more than a summer, I know that I have no problems at all with that person on call. They will be able to handle whatever comes at them and do so uh, with great customer service. Uh, so really, it doesn't don't limit yourself and and make sure you um, sort of express whatever it is that you're passionate about. I think that's important. Yeah, I think um, it's funny because the first person I ever heard mention the idea of somebody who's worked as a waiter or customer service was Payam. Um, and it's funny that I also then heard Laura say the same thing in a separate conversation and heard Anand say the same thing. Um, so in some ways, maybe, you know, radiologists are the sorts of people who do value overall emotional maturity and personal development. Um, but overall, I think it also implies just be who you are. Sometimes people are so focused on creating what they think is the template application. It comes across really bland um, and really forgettable. It, don't be embarrassed about the you know, past experiences or anything like that. Own it because that's part of who you're going to be in that program. And you don't want to spend your entire career in that program um, feeling like you don't belong because you're hiding your, your true self. Um, someone asked, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. Oh no, just to, I think um, just 
to echo that sort of comment, and, and this is something that in national radiology organizations is increasing, is increasing recognition of this, um, sort of the whole idea of like ACR 3.0 and organizations recognizing that we as radiologists need to sort of get out of the dark rooms and really engage with uh, our, our clients or our customers, however you wanna perceive that. That could be our referring clinicians, that could be the patients we see for biopsies, that could be the patients we see in IR clinic. Um, I think the, those experiences uh, actually add a lot of value and I think they can actually be packaged in a certain way to actually add a lot of strength to your application, uh, not just from the perspective of those people writing about that in their personal statements, but those people who are writing recommendation letters on those individuals' behalf to really emphasize how that connects to a larger narrative that it emphasizes the value of this specifically within radiology. Oh, I agree. Um, and more on meaningful experiences, can we repeat experiences from our personal statement or other noteworthy characteristics to tie our application together, or is it repetitive? I I, yeah, I hate silence, so I was, <laughs> uh, I'll start talking anytime there's a silence. So feel free to interrupt me. What I would say is uh, what I would not want to see is that you've copied and pasted. Uh, I, I, I would not do that. I think it's better to just not. Uh, um, but, but, but I think if you're alluding to the same experience, but maybe giving a complimentary sense, uh, you know, as long as it, I'm not reading the same thing twice, I think it's fine. Um, uh, so, so it can be about the same thing. I just wouldn't copy and paste. And yeah, I would I would agree with that. And you know, the other comment that I want to echo is really be yourself. Don't try to create an image that you think would be the, you know, the well-received image. And don't make up stuff when you do the, you know, when it you're writing a personal statement, you know, it's not uncommon. <laughs> so in our in our division, we're fortunate you know, to have people that speak multiple languages. If you said, you know, there was one instance somebody said I spoke Russian, I did my half my undergrad in Russia. Somebody who said that, you know, they did, you know, they speak, they spoke Spanish. We have an attending who was more than fluent enough. So we're gonna get the conversation there. And it's not really to prove, you know, anything, but it's just to see the authenticity. Are you lying about that? So if we find that you're lying about that, then your whole application now get dragged down. So little comment is now worth you know, bringing the, your whole, you know, how many years of work just down because of, you know, little statement like that. And gram, gram, grammar and all of those that take your time. A personal statement can have as much weight as your board score. So really take your time. Is worth, is the time well invested? Yeah, and I, I wanna uh, do a little takeoff there. Can you all share red flags that you've seen with applicants either on their application or interview day? Um, what red flags have you seen that we should look out for? <laughs> Where to start? Def definitely not being honest is, you know, it is like a no goes. I just shut down completely. Two things that really shut me down is if I find any anything you really try to make up stuff or to really make your application look good. Uh, the second thing would be uh, not giving, uh, not being prepared. You know, the interview days in Michigan is a big deal. We really shut down, you know, our procedure day. We make it, you know, you you spend all of this time, energy in the application. We really, you know, take that seriously and they give you the, the, day, the day. So there was one instance I remember, it's like it was yesterday, and this was two years ago. Uh, not too, a little less than two years ago, I think, yeah. But Zoom interviews, it doesn't require much. But one of the applicants literally, just woke up and was on the sofa to do the interview. You can tell that it, you know, it didn't even bother going and clean up before the interview. I mean, there's no way you're gonna get a positive feedback from that, right? So little things like that, uh, those are red flag. If you cannot be ready for interview day, that's supposed to be your best behavior. Imagine what's gonna come out of the rest. So be truthful, be prepared, and you know, let the application speak for itself. I'm going to add be on time like that's one of my big sticklers uh, if you show up late for your interview then chances are you're going to show up late for work and um, no one wants anybody someone in their program that's not hardworking. Um, the inability 
to talk about yourself or what you say that you have done, because it goes back to something Mamadou was saying is that when I hear that, I'm like, was well, this person lying to me? Like, did you really do this research project? Are you really interested in this topic? So anything in your application, you should be able um, to talk about it. And then I've also had some people who, you know, they give you that five second answer. You're just like, okay, on to the next one. And then the next question is like another five second answer. It's like, all right. So like you get repeated, you know, episodes like that. And you're, you're not going to score high on that interview. I love that. I, it's an interview. It's not an interrogation. Um, I, we don't want to just pepper you with questions like that and get, you know, as many questions in, in that time period with really short answers. We're actually trying to get to know you. So be knowable, actually give some, you know, weight to your, your answers and give some stories and, um, all of that to support your your answers. It, it actually makes it much more fun when we have a conversation versus an interrogation. Um, anything, anything on the other is, is fair, fair game. game. I'll, I'll also um, add just it, it's similar to being prepared, but um, have some questions um, to you know that to ask pr preferentially questions that. Um, show that you've looked into the program, that you know something about the program, questions that are, you know, tailored to that program. Um, if I usually, I, I will say, I usually start the interview with letting the applicant ask questions because I want to make sure that whatever questions they have are um, answered. And if they don't have any questions, it makes me think they're not really very interested. Uh, and along those lines, know the program. Um, these days, every program has a website and some of those programs are putting a lot of effort into creating videos just for you because you're not able to visit in, in person in this application season. So, you know, if there's stuff that they put out there, it's good to review it. So you're not asking the exact same things that they've already put a lot of effort into showing. It seems like you're not as interested in the program. And I know sometimes you get nervous, you're not sure exactly what to ask, um, but, hopefully it's not something that's answered wrote on the website or answered wrote in the in the video you have the advantage in a virtual interview to be able to prepare and put little post-it stickies uh, to remind yourself what the question was uh, that being said don't spend the whole interview reading off of post-its because we've had people try that we can tell um, if you're not connected and again it, it makes you wonder about the authenticity you know if you are nervous Maybe you initially rehearse with post-its, but get to the point where you're primarily off your post-its by the time you're um, doing your actual interview. I have a real quick uh, red flag here. Um, just, and this is more the case in in-person interviews uh, as opposed to virtual ones, but um, being disrespectful towards staff members, uh, the people who behind the scenes do so much work to prepare these applications, get organize these days, make sure people have great experiences and stuff. Um, that I've seen this pop consistently at every program I've been associated <laughs> with in my existence. But just if you're not respectful for the people who are doing all this work to make these days happen, mm, that's a <laughs> big, big red flag right there. And can I give very, a totally. very good point? Very Nowadays, good point. We, there's a paper trail because you're communicating with all those people via email. And so that whole paper trail, that email trail thread just gets forwarded um, to the PD. So really be very thoughtful. And, and so here's another question. When would be the best time to email the PD to show genuine interest in the program? Should it be before versus after applications are submitted, right after interviews? What's the best time? So I think it depends on what your goal is and where you are in the process. So um, if you are someone who hasn't gotten a lot of interviews, then I would start reaching out shortly after you hear the interviews. Other people have gotten interviews so that you can let programs know that you're interested and maybe they can pull your application before they send out interviews and they're, and they're no more available. Um, if you've gotten an interview and you really like that program, then I would reach out towards the end of the interview cycle and let them know, you know, that you are really interested in the program and how much you appreciate it and can see yourself being there. Should you email the PD more than once? Should you email them before and then after the interview? I think there is a, yeah, I think there is a fine line that everybody really trying to, you know, to walk. I think 
you know, after the interview, you know, being thankful and, you know, um, expressing your interest. And as you get closer to, you know, the March. So what I do when I get the, those, some of those interest emails, I, re, I legitimately got a folder. So I flag them, put in a folder. So once you get closer to, you know, making our rank list, you know, I look to see who reach out to us and then read through the emails again to refresh my memory. But the one thing, you know, I'm gonna echo that the one thing you can never go wrong is being, you know, um, really appreciative and respectful to the staff. Because after every single interview, when you're ranking, you give everybody numbers. And part of the people who give the numbers, you know, here is one of our admin. I always ask her, what do you think about this candidate? What are your top ones? And what are your bottom ones? And I, that carries a lot of weight. Because again, you go back to the authenticity. Are you being yourself? You may be impressing me, but behind the scene, you know, as soon as I'm not there, you like yourself. So those are the things that I really, you know, I think you cannot uh, overemphasize that. Yeah. Um, should we tell our number one program that they're first? Yeah, yes. I, I would say definite yes. I was in fact typing an answer to that question when I saw it pop up. Um, I think it can make a really big difference. I think um, it can't hurt to send a follow up saying, you know, you really enjoyed it and you could see yourself at the program. But frankly, I, if, if it's a competitive program, if you don't actually say the words, I'm going to rank you number one, it doesn't have nearly the same weight. That carries with it a, um, a strong message. So just saying, I'm going to rank you near the top of my list, is that a, is good, that a good thing? I think it doesn't, it doesn't really hurt, but I don't think it actually helps a whole lot from my experience. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would, I would echo that. I would echo the same statement. If you're interested, you know you're gonna be your number one, say it, really, really clearly say it, because it really would make a difference. A lot of candidates, we have difficulty choosing them. The one that said, you're gonna be the top, we're gonna to rank you high if you like you. But if you mention like, you're gonna be one of the top, my, this is how I see those emails that said, oh, you're one of my top programs. I honestly think sometimes it can hurt you because I know we're not, based on that, I'm not your number one. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. if you if it's not your number, number one, one, I think it's safer, safer to be on a quiet side. But if you're number one, absolutely say. Laura, were you going to say something? Nothing else, I don't think. Uh, I, wanted I wanted to ask, to ask what are some red flags that we should look for in programs? What should applicants be on the lookout for um, with programs that are red flags? I mean, I think I would say, um, uh, first of all, I would say pay attention to the, sometimes the programs are telling you who they are. And so you tell yourself, well, it'll be different or I'll be different or, uh, you know, and so sometimes it's not even a red flag. It's just glaring everywhere what, what the values a particular program has. And if it doesn't fit with your values, uh, you know, I think be thoughtful about whether you, you know, you would want to be there at all. Uh, and so I would say just the first step is sometimes people are telling you who they are, listen to them. I think certainly red flags you sometimes see, uh, or you, you hear about, you never see with any of the programs represented here. Uh, but sometimes you hear about uh, folks who would say that, you know, they, they try to say, muzzle one of the residents or, or, and then in what you find sometimes is the, the Zoom sessions the night before, there's people who uh, you know, aren't saying great things about the program and it's not sort of a balanced pros and cons. And so I think that you just have to be sensitive to those sorts of things. Um, and it's hard to really judge based on the interview or their video or their website, I think, you want to explore your network, ask folks uh, at your program or folks with whom you get to know, what do you know about this program? Um, because I, I do think 
that it's good to get as much information as possible. Residents are not shy about sharing what they think about their programs. So like if you ask, I think you'll get an honest answer and even silence says a lot. Uh, if a resident is really silent after an answer because uh, they don't want to say the wrong thing, I think that also speaks volumes. I remember asking when I was interviewing and when I heard a resident say, I love my program. I was like, there wasn't even a hesitation. And I was just like, okay, that just, it speaks volumes. And I would, I would just add to that. Um, I think it's really helpful if you can talk to a lot of different residents um, and not just the resident who you might have been sort of paired with. Um, you know, if, if you look on the website and you see, I don't know, different activities that certain residents, you know, that activities that you would be interested in participating in and reach out to some of the residents. Um, it gives you a perspective as to, um, you know, whether it would be the place where you'd feel comfortable in being yourself. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times the one, if there's just one or two residents that you speak to who are sort of picked to represent the program and to be cheerleaders, um, it doesn't give a very broad perspective. Absolutely, and the alumni can also uh, be very honest. Um, asking how many residents complete their program uh, versus transferring out can sometimes also be clarifying. Um, but yeah, I think the residents paint a really good picture of what's happening in the program. Can I say one more thing? Um, I tell people to, you know, we have these virtual open houses and a lot of times there's residents on there. I tell people get the residents contact information that day, but then hit them up like two weeks later, three weeks later when they're not in sale mode because you're going to get the truth. Um, the other thing that I'm going to, I'm going to attack this question a different way. A lot of our programs are very similar, but there are differences. And a lot of the applicants, you guys are very similar, but you guys have differences. There is something that is truly important to you and you need to take the time to figure out what that is. And that's how you need to go by evaluating these programs to see if they match up with what's important to you. Because if not, you're going to have, I checked these boxes because people said these boxes were important, but that was important to them. That wasn't important to you. So take the time now to figure out what you really want in a program. And if it's not present two years from now, when you match, you're not going to be happy. What is it? Figure that part out. Yeah, excellent. Um, so we're right about at the hour mark, but I just wanted to give each of the panelists just a chance to say just a closing statement, anything you just want the applicants to take away from this call tonight. Uh, who wants to go first? I'll go. Uh, so can I give two things? Um, one, eye contact. So I'm a big person on eye contact. So I know it's over Zoom, so practice. I don't like when people's eyes are all up here, they're looking around like I'm right here, like look right there. Uh, so try to maintain eye contact, practice it. I think it's important. Um, and two, I'm just gonna ask, people ask what we're looking for. I'm looking for a hustler. I know that has a bad connotation, but I'm looking for somebody that's a grinder, you're hardworking, because I don't want somebody to get in my program. And you told me how hard you're, you're gonna work when you get here. And then you show up and it's like, really, you, you want me to read? Or I'm so exhausted after being sitting in front of a computer for eight hours. So I want somebody that's hardworking. So that's what I'm looking for. Um, this is a very long and difficult journey. And I think that what the, the one thing that I would say to take home is that you know, you could do everything right. And there's a lot of chance and randomness associated with this. Uh, don't take those things personally and uh, uh, keep, keep on um, keeping on. And, uh, and I think that, you know, don't lose hope and recognize that, you know, that the timing uh, is very well. Last year was a much more competitive year for whatever reason. Um, but I think that, you know, over time, if this is the right thing for you, 
uh, you know, um, keep that hope and um, and don't don't take it personally in that way. Um, and that's that's one thing I would say. I will say that um, residency is a time, it's a period of your life where a lot of life happens. Um, you know, people, good things in life, people get married, people have children, bad things in life, people's, you know, family get, get sick. Um, so I think that it's important, as, as Marcus said, to figure out what's important to you, um, what you're looking for, and the type of people that you want to um, surround yourself um, with for support. Um, because your resonant mates um, are going to be essentially your support system potentially for you know four years and so that's i think an important thing to keep in mind i want to know who you are and it's a lot of times all the applicants kind of blend into it with each other and may not remember a name but sometimes i will remember like oh that person shared with me like uh, you know they're the plumber's daughter who worked the summer at x y or z and i may not know your name but i know your experience and so share your experiences don't be ashamed of your experiences share what your passions are about what you're going to bring to the residency and that's what's going to in my eyes set you apart from others um so let us see who you are um yeah <laughs> no the I'll, I'll definitely would uh echo what all of you guys just said uh and uh i like the the suggestion that marcus made about the taking the phone number i think i'm going to suggest that to the interviewers you know next time around you know, talk to them later, you know, because those are, you know, some of your best resources. As far as the eye contact thing is concerned, uh, I know, you know, out of time, but that was really a hard thing for me because I grew up, you know, in, coming from, you know, Africa, eye contact is not something we do. We usually look down as a sign of respect. So for, uh, for me, during interviews, I really had to make an effort to make that happen. So just to put that out there. But, the, you know, the, if you got to, take anything out of today, I think the, you know, for me, the number one, you know, some of the most important thing is really be honest, be yourself. We want to know who you are. We really don't hide behind anything else. Uh, personal statement, spend time on a personal statement because, you know, that's really what's going to tell us how you're seeing yourself, you know, so there's nothing more powerful than that. And last, don't limit yourself, you know, the sky's the limit apply, don't worry about the board score and stuff. Think, things gonna work out. Don't limit yourself, really. Um, I just wanna end by being, uh, first express my thanks for being part of this panel and uh, so many tremendous insights and uh, getting to know some of the students from the comments here for this. Um, I, I think one of the things I just wanna say is that um, you've all made a great uh, decision by showing interest in this great field. And as you can see, so many of us here are so excited to be Part of the field and the specialty, and feel like we can really have make an impact and make a real impact in terms of uh, providing great care for our patients and, and doing that. So I want to commend you all for doing that. And um, with programs like you know, our, our goal here is really to help you all thrive. And I think we all share this view that you know it's it's you know our goal and and we something we take a lot of pride in is is watching you all come to our programs and seeing you start off as first year residents and as you know starting off your internship and, and really watching you grow and develop into clinicians and to scholars or researchers and teachers and that's some of the things we really take a lot of joy in and, and pride into that so uh commend you all for being right here and uh, we look forward to seeing you all on the trail yeah yeah that's wonderful i i agree with all the comments thank you to all the panelists i'll just uh say that to each of you just be kind to yourselves and be kind to each other as you go through the application season um it's interesting we leave these panels every year and, and i think i speak for all of us panelists we'll have a number of applicants will reach out to us for mentorship or advice or follow us on Twitter and all those sorts of things. Yeah, that's great. Um, but really follow each other too. become friends with each other. If you hear of somebody having
having an open house, you know, pull that other uh, applicant in. What's really interesting is you all are resources. The, app, the, the residents at current programs are a resource, but the medical students who went to those programs, right, that were at the same school, they sometimes know some of the things that would be helpful information for you, right? They know if that really famous radiologist is really somebody who refuses to work with residents, right? So there, there's an, you have the ability to, to make each other's experience better. Um, and, you know, Marcus can tell you this. We had a year, maybe two years ago, where all of the applicants who had been on this panel went together and formed this group and they would invite, you know, different attendings to come talk to them. And it was like, oh, okay, all right. And we would we would show up and, you know, and they would text us questions as they went through the application season. So, you know, be kind to each other, be kind to yourselves. Uh, so anyway, we got a round up, we're, we're over time, but I really wanna express my gratitude to all of the panelists for once again, giving up their Friday nights to be here for you all, uh, sharing so much positivity. Thank you so much to all of you who shared your questions and who joined and who, you know, forwarded the links to your to your friends. Uh, really excited for your application season. Really excited to see you all become residents and radiologists. And then we'll be calling on you uh, in a few years to come do this for a tour for diversity. So thank you all. Thank you all so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I really, really appreciate your help uh, getting, getting all of this all done, done this, this year. year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah our, our pleasure. pleasure. Well, have a good have night. A good you too. Marcus, I'll see you in a week. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>